grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, once again, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Today marks the fourth Sunday in the season of Easter. It is the fourth Sunday of Easter, and traditionally this Sunday is called Good Shepherd Sunday. And Good Shepherd Sunday is named for the traditional gospel, the historic gospel that is associated with this day. And it comes from John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And for those of us in Western society who aren't all that familiar with sheep and shepherding and agrarian imagery, we have to take a little moment and pause because our culture hasn't been an agrarian culture for many years now, and it's certainly not an, ag an agrarian culture like first century Israel. Now, when I mention Good Shepherd Sunday, some of you who are listening may well remember the way that you grew up. Perhaps you grew up on a farm. Maybe you have some memory of it. Maybe others of you remember going to your grandparents' farm and have some memory of, of sheep and what you do with them. But if you guys are like your pastor, I've never been around sheep except in a petting zoo. And so I have absolutely no knowledge of shepherding and I have no knowledge of sheep. And yet it doesn't take much in the context of the biblical witness to get at least a rudimentary understanding of sheep culture as it is. Uh, Luther says this in his commentary on Psalm 23. A sheep is a poor, weak, simple beast that can neither fend nor rule itself, nor find the right way, nor protect itself against any kind of danger or misfortune. Moreover, it is by nature timid, shy, and likely to go astray. When it does go a bit astray and leaves its shepherd, it is unable to find its way back to him, and it strays about until a wolf seizes it or perishes in some other way. And so overall, the, the biblical image that we have of sheep is not particularly positive. And so it's a little insulting, a little off-putting for us in our, in our current context when we realize that the sheep that Scripture is often talking about isn't referring to the animal, but it's referring to us, calling us sheep. And that confronts the image that we like to present of ourselves to the rest of the world rather than being, as Luther says, um, timid and shy and likely to go astray, we would much rather tell the world or project for the world an image that we're confident, we're strong, we're self-assured, we're independent, we're capable. And it's been increasingly easy over the past several decades to convince ourselves that we are more than just sheep. Certainly since the dawn of the modern era, it has been increasingly easy to do that. After all, if you think about where the majority of us live, we now live in climate-controlled homes. We have clean running water. We have indoor plumbing. We have a safe and secure food supply. We have electricity. And that doesn't even begin to enumerate all of the other things that we enjoy as part of, of, as part of normal American culture. You think of the advances in science and medicine the computers, the cell phones, the multiple cars that most of us also have. And the list just goes on and on and on. So it's not surprising that for us, we've come to expect that kind of existence as just our right. It's our natural due for being the wonderful people that we imagine ourselves to be. But when something like the coronavirus that we're now enduring pops up, and it strips away all of that. It dispels our illusion. And we are revealed as nothing more than sheep in people's clothing. The safety that we took for granted has been removed. And we find out that we are vulnerable after all. And in that position of vulnerability, we begin to realize once again that we need a shepherd. The problem, however, is that all of the shepherds, quote unquote, that we would raise up for ourselves all of our leaders are inadequate to the task because we find out they're nothing more than the same kind of sheep that we are. All of our collective wisdom has been inadequate 
up to this point to overcome the problem that we're facing. The advice that we've been receiving from those who've been in power and those who've been in charge has been rather sheepish. It's shelter in place. Don't go out. Limit your contacts. Don't trust anyone. I.e., be afraid. Be very afraid. And as a result, we have an economy that's in shambles, people who are out of work. We have a society in turmoil. We're milling about like sheep in a pen. And I don't blame our leaders. I don't blame those who are in charge because they've done the best that they can with the information and the medicine that we have available right now. We just have to admit that we don't have a solution for our current problem. But the ultimate answer for our current problem isn't going to be found in any human shepherd. Rather, we have a moment here as God's people to remember who our real shepherd is. And we get the chance to seek the peace and security that are unaffected by the storms of this life. And Psalm 23 is a psalm that we usually read on this Good Shepherd Sunday. And Psalm 23 is probably the best known and best loved psalm in all of scripture. But you may not have taken a chance to examine it closely uh, at another time. Uh, this psalm is not just about shepherding and sheep, even though it begins with the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It doesn't continue with that theme. It actually joins two separate visions together and is held together in the middle by another part. So Psalm 23 begins with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. It ends with the imagery actually of a banquet. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And what connects those two images of shepherding and sheep and a banquet is the middle part, and it's God's presence. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What connects Psalm 23's beginning and ending images in the middle is God's presence with his people. Our Lord is a God who delights to be present with his people. We were created for that kind of face-to-face -face fellowship with God. When we look back in the book of Genesis, back at the creation, before sin ever came into the world, we see that God came into the Garden of Eden at the end of the day, in the cool of the evening, as scripture says, and he was looking for Adam and Eve. He was coming to fellowship with Adam and Eve. And we get the impression that this wasn't unusual. This is just the way that the day went. God came in and spoke with us daily. And yet our sin disrupted that relationship. It introduced all kinds of suffering into the world. Hence, we look at the Psalm 23 and we get the image of the valley of the shadow of death. And yet, despite that valley of the shadow of death, despite the, the sin and the problems that that sin introduced into the creation, God still desires to be with us. He still desires to be with us even in that valley. And so our Lord made a way. Our Lord made a way not only to be with his creation in the birth of Jesus Christ, but through that same Jesus to save and redeem and remake his creation. Not just us, but the entire creation. And so we don't have to fear the valley of the shadow of death anymore because our Lord has already walked through it for us. And he rose victorious that first Easter morning to give us that victory. And his victory means that we now can enjoy the green pastures and the, and the table fellowship that Psalm 23 talks about with our Lord in his house and in his presence forever. Scripture has a beautiful symmetry to it. Scripture begins and ends in a garden. In the beginning, the Bible opens at the dawn of time in the Garden of Eden. And man and God are in fellowship with one another. 
when Scripture closes in the book of Revelation, we see a restored garden and we hear God's declaration from the throne, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things, the former things have passed away. And in between those two images of a garden is a story of how our good shepherd, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, triumphed over the valley of death so that it remains only a shadow for us. My brothers and sisters, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And because he, is, he, is, he lives, you too shall live. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.